If you've ever done research in the field of reconstructing Earth's history, you know that a lot of it has to be based on assumptions, which are generally reasonable assumptions made based on modern processes. However, sometimes certain factors completely throw off all of our assumptions and we have to make new ones. One such factor is continental configuration. Okay, so I'm exaggerating a tiny bit. It doesn't throw out all of our assumptions, but it definitely changes the way that we interpret how we reconstruct Earth's past. In this video, I'm going to be talking specifically about how continental configurations, how the continents are dispersed across Earth's surface, affects oxygen concentrations in the ocean, which can have a major effect on marine life, obviously. So I'll start by talking about why studying oxygen concentrations matter, the typical controlling factors on oxygen concentrations in the ocean, how continental configuration can affect oxygen concentrations, and why this continental control on oxygen matters, specifically for how we reconstruct ancient oceanic and atmospheric oxygen concentrations. Changes in oceanic oxygen concentrations drive marine evolution and extinction, or at least have driven very major evolutionary and extinction events throughout Earth's history. If you want to learn more specifically about the control of oxygen on marine life, I talk a lot about how oxygen has affected animal evolution and diversification in the video that I will link up to the top right right now, and you can check that out after watching this one. Some examples of events that oxygenation or oxygen concentration increases have contributed to include the Ediacaran radiation of animals just before the Cambrian explosion around 570 million years ago. Another event likely driven by oxygenation was the Great Ordovician biodiversification event around 500 million years ago. And lastly, the rise of large predatory fish in the Devonian around 400 million years ago was also likely driven by oxygen concentration increases. The opposite process, deoxygenation or the decrease of oxygen concentrations in the ocean, has been a major driver or seems to have been a major driver of major Phanerozoic mass extinctions. The Phanerozoic eon is the eon that we are currently in. It just refers to basically from the Cambrian period around 540 million years ago to today zero million years ago. <laughs> but it's not like oxygen concentrations were important back then, but are not anymore. They still very much are. In fact, currently, oxygen concentrations in the ocean are decreasing. And this is due to global warming, both directly due to solubility effects, as well as indirectly by changes in circulation mixing and the primary productivity oxygen respiration cycle. I've talked more about that in a lot of other videos, so I'm not going to touch on that here. But the gist of these first two slides is is that oxygen concentrations in the ocean are very important and it's important that we reconstruct them and understand their effects on life. And that requires us to understand the underlying mechanisms and factors that control oxygen concentrations and have caused oxygen fluctuations throughout Earth's history. So what does control oceanic oxygen concentrations? It's largely controlled by atmospheric oxygen because atmospheric oxygen obviously interchanges with surface ocean oxygen and they should be relatively in equilibrium, at least in the modern global ocean. Another major control on ocean oxygen is atmospheric carbon dioxide fluctuations, primary productivity fluctuations, and weathering and carbon burial fluctuations. These all kind of come back to the one thing, which is oxygen sink versus oxygen source. When you have increased primary productivity, weathering, and carbon burial, you have increased oxygen in the atmosphere because that oxygen is not being used up to decompose organic material, and that's also decreasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so it's the cycle. If you had the opposite, less weathering, less carbon burial, you would have more oxidation of organic matter and less overall atmospheric oxygen. And so you'd have a decrease in atmospheric oxygen. And this fluctuates throughout Earth's history based on this respiration, productivity, carbon burial cycle. And that kind of cycle has always been considered the major reason why we have big spikes and dips in oxygen and carbon throughout Earth's history and major climate changes, because sometimes that cycle is thrown off balance to one direction or another, causing major cooling or uh, warming. However, <laughs> there are occurrences in the rock record and therefore in Earth's history in which ocean oxygen concentrations varied independently of these factors and therefore point to something else. What other factor might affect oxygen concentrations in the ocean? Continental rearrangement. Continental rearrangements have driven oxygen variations in Earth's past 
and they've induced decoupling between the upper and benthic ocean oxygen. So uh, the surface and the subsurface oxygen. But how slash why does this happen? It's because the continental arrangement affects ocean circulation. And when continents rearrange, ocean circulation also has to change. We know, or at least those of you who have followed my channel for a while know, that ocean circulation can cause major warming slash cooling events. I actually talk about this in my Modern Ice Age video where I discuss how the onset of the Modern Ice Age was initiated due to the isolation of Antarctica at the South Pole, leading to isolation of cool water currents around Antarctica at the South Pole. So this was a change in ocean circulation that majorly changed the climate by kickstarting a cooling event. But how does ocean circulation affect oxygen concentrations in the ocean? It does so by affecting ocean mixing. Changes in ocean circulation can change mixing regimes and therefore cause stagnation throughout the water column. And if you have oceanic water column stagnation, that leads to deep ocean anoxia. In other words, the deep ocean lacking oxygen because mixing between the surface waters and the deep waters is required to provide well oxygenated surface waters to the deep ocean and vice versa the deep ocean nutrient rich waters provide nutrients to the primary producers at the surface it's a cycle if the mixing is thrown off and stagnation occurs you get anoxia in the deep waters and nutrient limitation in the surface waters until you get mixing again an example of ocean circulation changes leading to deep ocean anoxia is seen in the early Phanerozoic throughout the Cambrian or Vision Silurian around 500 to 400-ish million years ago. And these instances of deep ocean anoxia are significant because they likely occurred under modern atmospheric oxygen concentrations, suggesting that rather than low atmospheric oxygen concentrations causing the anoxia, which is what we normally consider as the cause of ocean anoxia throughout Earth's history, it was rather ocean circulation changes due to continental rearrangement. However, I don't want to sit here and say that there was modern levels of atmospheric oxygen at the time of the early Paleozoic for sure, because we're not sure of that. Um, there's many debated hypotheses here. Um, so just know that this is one possibility, and there's other possibilities that suggest that modern levels of atmospheric oxygen were not reached until after, or kind of in the early Paleozoic, even though previously we thought it was before the Paleozoic, before the Cambrian explosion and all that. So there's competing hypotheses. The hypothesis that ocean circulation transitions did lead to deep ocean anoxia during the early Paleozoic would offer an explanation for the elevated rates of radiation and extinction during this time. Like I've mentioned in other videos, the Ediacaran to Cambrian to Ordovician periods of the early Paleozoic and just before it were filled with kind of evolutionary experimentation and radiations and diversifications as well as extinction events. And this had a lot to do with just the fact that biology had for the first time been forming these really large, diverse, complex ecosystems, and there was major competition, there was major climatic changes, and also there was major continental and circulation changes. So it was likely a very much combination of things, but these ocean circulation transitions offer a good explanation for the potential initial driving factor causing such evolutionary radiation and extinction events. So now we've talked about how continents affect ocean oxygen concentrations, but why does it matter? Why does it matter that continental rearrangements cause ocean anoxic or oxygenation events rather than what we had initially thought, which was it was mainly driven by surface or atmospheric oxygen fluctuations? Well, many paleo-redox proxies have been developed over the past few decades. What are these? These are proxies that we use to reconstruct ancient oxygenation conditions, basically. My PhD research is actually on refining the reconstructions we make using molybdenum by just refining our understanding of the factors that affect molybdenum preservation in the rock record. By using these paleo-redox proxies, especially multi-proxy 
reconstructions, we can basically reconstruct a good idea of Earth's oceanic oxygenation history. As this graph shows here from the you know beginning of Earth before oxygen was around, because it wasn't around until oxygenic photosynthesis evolved. And then you have the great oxidation event around 2.4 billion years ago, then the boring billion where not much occurred. Um, well, you had some fluctuation, but things remained relatively low in oxygen. And then you had another bump in the Neoproterozoic just before the Cambrian, and the Paleozoic era. And that brought oxygen concentrations to near modern levels. Again, this is debated whether it happened in the Neoproterozoic just before the Paleozoic or the early Paleozoic is still debated. But in any case, it rose eventually to modern levels. And we can reconstruct this oxygen history because we have these paleo redox proxies. However, this is the kicker. Changes in ocean oxygen concentrations are often interpreted as changes in atmospheric oxygen, or at least interpreted to be directly proportional to changes in atmospheric oxygen concentrations. Why is this important? Because sometimes our proxies, which are all reconstructing or mostly reconstructing ocean oxygen rather than atmospheric, sometimes they are changing or we see fluctuations due to things like continental rearrangement rather than changes in atmospheric oxygen concentrations. So it's really important that we start to consider changes in ocean circulation as a cause for our, you know, proxy reconstructions of ocean oxygen concentrations in the rock record, rather than just jumping to the assumption that that reflects the atmospheric oxygen at the time. Now, I don't want to make it sound like we do do that, because we tend to try and consider every factor that was affecting whatever proxy that we're looking at, or the record of the proxy that we're looking at. Um, but this is something that I think has had little consideration throughout our paleo redox reconstruction history, basically. This is important because, as I mentioned throughout the video, continental configuration can modulate the distribution of oxygen in the ocean. Now, we do have some paleo-redox proxies that are really good at getting at global conditions, which are typically used in tandem with other proxies for local conditions just to make sure that we're getting the right signal. But sometimes we just use local. And if we are using proxies that reconstruct local conditions, the circulation at the time and continental configuration could play a major role in affecting these oxygen concentrations. So in any case, we need to make sure we consider this continental configuration ocean circulation factor when we're interpreting our proxy records. Additionally, as I mentioned earlier, models suggest that continental rearrangement can decouple surface and subsurface oxygen concentrations. What does this mean? Well, temporal subsurface variations, so oxygen concentration variations at depth, are more exaggerated than those at the surface. And this is caused by organic matter respiration at the surface that amplifies subsurface oxygen variability. In other words, continental distribution and ocean circulation changes alter the resupply of nutrients to the surface from the subsurface. So how ocean circulation works in a stable scenario and the respiration and production cycle, like I mentioned earlier, is you have the surface waters where you have primary production of oxygen and organic matter. And below that, you've got really nutrient-rich deep waters in these Nutrient-rich deep waters are upwelled at continental margins, which is driven by surface winds, and this upwelling of nutrient-rich waters supplies nutrients to the primary producers and allows them to continue their productivity, and then the surface water can downwell to the bottom, supplying the deep nutrient-rich but oxygen-poor waters with oxygen-rich waters. The downwelling typically occurs at continental margins at the poles where cold water sinks because it's denser than warm water and this brings the well oxygenated water to the deep subsurface. However, this downwelling and upwelling cycle that controls the resupply of nutrients to primary producers at the surface, which produce oxygen and therefore control oxygen in the subsurface, are highly affected when continents rearrange and ocean circulation rearranges. So for a certain amount of time after continental rearrangement and therefore circulation rearrangement, you have a decoupling in surface and subsurface oxygen reservoirs. If given enough time and geographical stability, those oxygen reservoirs should re-equilibrate to some degree at least as we see in the modern ocean. In most areas of the modern ocean that are not restricted, the waters are very well oxygenated regardless of depth. 
So why is this decoupling of surface to subsurface oxygen important? Well, remember, not only do we use paleoredox proxies to reconstruct deep ocean oxygen concentrations, we also relate those concentrations to both surface oxygen concentrations and atmospheric ones. And I just talked about in the previous slide how we can't necessarily assume that ocean oxygen concentrations are equal to or correlate directly with atmospheric ones. And we also apparently cannot assume that subsurface and surface ocean oxygen concentrations directly correlate with one another. Models have been run that only consider continental configuration and continental reconfiguration through Earth's history while keeping temperature, atmospheric, CO2, and oxygen concentrations, as well as other factors, constant. And these models can actually accurately predict the timing of certain OAEs, or ocean anoxic events, throughout Earth's history, such as the Permo-Triassic ocean anoxic, or at least deep ocean anoxic event, around 260 million years ago. These models also accurately predict the timing of the early Cretaceous ocean anoxic event, around 120 million years ago, as well as the late Cretaceous 100-ish million year ago ocean anoxic event. However, other OAEs, other ocean anoxic events throughout Earth's history, are not predicted using this kind of model, suggesting that other factors, factors other than continental rearrangement, probably caused those events. Now, that's not to say that these events that are predicted by these models were only caused by continental rearrangement, but rather that continental rearrangement played a role. And there were other causes that probably contributed to the anoxic event. However, ocean circulation does seem to have played a major role during the early Paleozoic anoxia and anoxic swings, suggesting that the transition from a well-ventilated ocean circulation state to a poorly ventilated ocean circulation state caused the early Paleozoic evolution and extinction swings. These state transitions seem to be characteristic of continental configurations where one pole is free of land, such as those in the early Paleozoic where there's no land at the North Pole. This finding supports the uranium and molybdenum paleoredox proxy evidence for early Paleozoic deep ocean anoxic swings. Therefore, it's really important that we note that early Paleozoic atmospheric oxygen may not have been much lower than modern atmospheric oxygen concentrations. In other words, it wasn't necessarily continued low oxygen into the early Paleozoic that caused these anoxic swings, but rather continental rearrangement. Overall, continental configuration models and the molybdenum record, the molybdenum, by the way, is one of the most well-established and useful and global paleoredox proxies that we use, so it's really important. Um, but these records and models suggest that major oscillations in ocean oxygen concentrations are characteristic of the early Paleozoic due to continental rearrangement and subsequent instability of ocean circulation. And the steady state Earth system has been progressively stabilizing chemically and geographically throughout the Phanerozoic eon from 540 million years ago at the beginning of the Cambrian to today. This stabilization would actually explain the decreasing extinction rates throughout the eon as well. So because changes in continental configuration can induce major changes in circulation and ocean oxygenation or deoxygenation, we need to consider this when interpreting paleoredox proxy records. Understanding the underlying controls on ocean anoxia or just ocean oxygen concentrations in general, as well as atmospheric ones, is key for such reconstructions. And if you want to know more about some other factors that affect oxygenation throughout Earth's history, as well as how oxygen affects biological evolution and extinction events, you can check out this video on how oxygen might have triggered animal evolution. And you can check out my biogeochemistry playlist for more on how biology, chemistry, and geology have co-evolved and affected each other throughout Earth's history. With that, thank you guys so much for watching. If you want to check out my references, they are linked down in the description box below. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.